Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And we have an exciting episode for you today, something I've wanted to do for a long time. We are going to talk about Baijiu, Chinese white alcohol, Yay. Um, the national drink. And we're going to be having some alongside some other things. Yeah. So just a warning, compared to our normal episode, this is going to have a lot of environmental sounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if you don't want to hear glasses and things clinking, this might not be the episode for you. Also, I think our audiences can. You think they can handle it? Yeah. Can we handle it, Cherry? We might get a little wild by the end of this episode. Well, it depends on how much. Let me just describe what it looks like in our studio, a.k.a. <laughs> Our living room. <laughs> <laughs> we have some booze on the table. We have some booze in, on the table. We have multiple cups and bowls. We'll explain why. Um, also, it is hot as crap here at the moment. Yeah. I thought you lived in Texas at one point. Yeah, only for two years. And, well, that, and that wasn't hot enough? And I lived in Georgia, but then I left uh, by choice. Right, <laughs> okay. It was too hot. All right, Cherry. So, the episode. Yay. It might shock you pretend to be shocked <laughs> okay that the world's most produced and drunk spirit is not whiskey vodka gin or rum but in fact the chinese spirit known as baijo wow i know i'm so shocked i know i was I shocked had too. no idea no we never have discussed this before no but what is baijo what is its history what is it produced from what does it taste like can i make cherry drink it with me on this episode and how can a spirit that few outside china have heard of been so be so popular well i don't think there's a question about can you make cherry drink it with you i think we agree okay <laughs> the last question is also easy yeah there's lots of chinese people and they drink really? a lot of baijo <laughs> that's why it's the most drank spirit in the world cherry wow i did not i would not have figured that no, out by myself out, yeah there's a lot of you guys yeah <laughs> <laughs> so a few that's news to me <laughs> a few caveats though yeah to explain to the naysayers in the audience who are out there cherry these naysayers okay South Korea's Hite Jinro company often claims its soju is the world's best-selling spirit. Mm. This, however, only refers to it being the best-selling spe specific brand, though, not the best-selling category of spirit. Okay. Also, soju is one half to one third the strength of most baijos, so it's sort of in a different class almost entirely. Mm. Soju is like thirteen to twenty-four percent. Baijo is like usually over fifty percent, so it's. So in classic Chinese fashion tradition, yeah, I'm gonna be very outraged right now that some Korean, some Korean people dare to take something else away from us. I know. Aside Cherry. from Confucius, that and, was a joke, everyone. And, that was a joke. And, and, I'm not really. <laughs> and kimchi and everything else. <laughs> yeah. Cherry was so outraged one time when I what? offhand. No. What? Years ago, when I when I offhand thought that the Japanese people had invented soy sauce. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of offended. <laughs> Jerry was. I was like, was how dare you? So, it turns out, no, Japanese people did not invent soy sauce, which is actually going to come up in this episode. Okay. So, beer is the most popular alcoholic beverage in general. Okay. I think it's worldwide. actually... Worldwide? Worldwide. I think in China, too, beer mm. is the most popular beverage. But I'm specifically talking about distilled beverages, not beer or wine. Okay. Anyway, baijiu means white alcohol in Mandarin and actually refers to a variety of Chinese liquors that share certain ingredients, production techniques, and flavor profiles. It is, however, by Ch Chinese standards, a rather recent creation, only going back several hundred years. Oh. Distillation itself is only, you know, a, a thousand or so years old. In China, it really only mentored mass production in like the 1400s about. So we'll, oh. we'll talk about it. Okay. What did you, what did, or you're going to get to we're it? What did people to... drink before it? Oh, we're going to get to it, Okay. Cherry. In order to get at its roots, we have to go back further, though, to the roots of Chinese civilization itself. Mm. We're going back. It's inaccurate to say humankind invented fermentation, the process of creating alcohol. It's a natural process caused by certain types of yeast bacteria, which eat sugar and poop out alcohol and CO2. This process happens naturally and without human intervention. And certain animals, for example, such as monkeys, have been known to collect fallen fruits and stash them or eat them once they fermented oh. in order to get drunk. Okay. Humans, however, discovered how to make this process faster, more reliable, and repeatable. Mm. The first evidence of purpose-made fermentation goes back around 8,500 8, years to 6,500 BC. Mm. And China was amongst the earliest sites where evidence has been found. These early drinks were made from a variety of materials, honey, fruits, grains, 
depending on what was available. The conversion of society from hunter-gatherers to agriculture has always fascinated historians, as initially the task of domesticating plants and animals and being tied to a specific location did not always seem to provide an advantage over a nomadic lifestyle. In many cases, lifespans and things like that actually went down when people stopped being hunter-gatherers. Really? Well, because you're more at the risk of famines and droughts and all that kind of stuff. Okay. You know, and also society gets bigger, it gets more complicated, there's more points of failure. Okay. However, some historians now believe it was alcohol itself that prompted the change. Oh. That the need to reliably collect ingredients and remain in a single location to watch over fermentation vessels prompted early tribes to settle and grow crops in order to guarantee a steady supply of booze. In order to get drunk. Yeah, in order to get drunk. Okay. I mean, if you've never had any any sort of mood-altering substance, Cherry, you're a nomadic Chinese person 10,000 years ago. I don't know if you would call them Chinese 10,000 years ago. Well, proto-Chinese, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. You live in China, right? Today, China. Today, China. Yeah. Um, so, well, or even like ancient, like the kingdom of Wu or something, you know. Sure. But <laughs> if, that doesn't paint a very... Ins- I mean, I don't know if it does, but... That doesn't paint a very, like, by modern definition, yeah. inspiring picture of humankind. Reality's tough, Jerry. I know. Sometimes you need a break from it. Yeah. You know? I mean, the Asian people, they were just chill. Yeah. You know? Well, the first time one of them figured out how to make some booze, and they're like, get a load of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty exciting. So early Chinese liquor production was likely similar to beer, cider, and European wine. And yes, people think that that's what, the reason why some of the middle uh, original... Chinese kingdoms and mm-hmm. settlements formed, you know, um, between the Yangtze and the uh, uh, Yellow River, mm-hmm. making booze. Okay. Making not, crops and booze. Yeah, not for sure, though, but it's a theory. Okay. So, yeah, original Chinese liquor, similar to beer, cider, and wine. You know, you leave stuff out. You let yeast ferment it. It's not distilled, but it's fermented. No, and sometimes you add the old stuff to the new stuff to kind of jumpstart it. Like okay. sourdough, if you've ever made that. <laughs> Everyone has made that during the pandemic. Yes, everyone or suddenly became to, a, at least. Some, everyone suddenly became a baker. Yeah. Um, mythically, this early alcohol is either attributed to Yi Di or Du Kong, both of which would later become gods of wine. Hmm. However, at some point, perhaps four to five thousand years ago, Chu was discovered, where, which is where Chinese and eventually Asian alcohol production would branch off in its own direction. Hmm. The most popular beverage using Chu would eventually be called Hongju. Yellow alcohol. Okay. I'm pronouncing it right? Yeah. Good enough. I, I would just specify for our Chinese audiences. Yeah. It's chu, like jiu chu, chu, chu. and uh, huang jiu, like yellow, huang jiu. yellow alcohol. <laughs> Hong jiu would be like red uh, wine. So actually, there were reddish varieties of these, of these older liquors that used to just be called red wine. Ooh. And then they changed the name because now European wine, I think, is called red wine. Red wine. Mm. They, they took the name, Cherry, from Chinese people, just like Dior took that dress. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Don't get me started on that. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, and just to specify, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was a big deal. Yeah, we got to do an episode on, <laughs> on, on Chinese I'm doing air quotes, which you can't see, but fashion appropriation. Um, well, more like the Han um, closing, like Han ethnic, ethnic Han chauvinist, quote unquote, traditional closing, yeah. which a lot of it are not traditional. Yeah. Carry on, please. Okay. So, um, so this is the most popular beverage made with Chu. Am I saying it right? Chu? Close enough? Okay. A hundred out of a hundred. Okay. But as we discuss it, let's drink some bowls together. This early into the podcast. <laughs> let's have some Orientalism, Cherry, as sworn brothers sisters well they, they you know they wouldn't get to do this cherry i know sisters. but we can reinvent okay we'll be the sisters yeah we'll be the swearing sisters so this is some cheap is that the wine stopper you just pulled out yeah what's wrong okay. with, what's wrong with the <laughs> this is some cheap uh shaoxing wine okay i got at 99 ranch yeah pagoda brand and a lot of shaoxing wine is for cooking this is for drinking and this is or you can cook with it too there I'm are sure. fancy huangzhou huang huangzhou huangzhou Wanjo. Oh, good. Okay. That you can get, but I couldn't find any of it. I could only find the cheap stuff. So this is what we're drinking. Okay. I mean, it's not that cheap. It was like, How much was it? It was like $9 for it. I know, but like a cheap bottle of wine, you know. Yeah, I guess that's true. It's not that cheap. This and is, just is... for audiences, um, we're drinking. I. <laughs> we're drinking from bowls. Like, like rice bowls? Yeah. It's as if we're in like some ancient... It's like we're in the water margins. No, we're like... We're like 
in the romance of the three kingdoms. Okay. Do you want to be Le Bay or can I be Le Bay? I, uh, whoa. Okay. <laughs> now this is a, <laughs> Who do you want to this be? is an existential Guan question. Guan Yu? Zhang Fei? I think I want to be Guan Yu. You want to be Guan Yu? Okay. Yeah. I'll be Le Bay then. Okay. So Cherry, we need to swear uh. as sisters that we will always be true to each other. Okay. And that we will defeat the tyrant Dong Zhou. You know. Okay, but are we going to smash our bowls on the floor? No, afterwards? we're not going to smash the bowls on the floor afterwards. Okay, in but consideration we... of our neighbors? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we need to clink them. Okay, one, two. Okay, you could just clink it normally. I... Wow. <laughs> so we're going to defeat the tyrant. Do Dongo. we have to drink it all? No, don't drink all this. Okay. I mean, you can if you want. <laughs> it's not really yellow. It no. looks more like a brownish red. So the stuff we're drinking, it's about 17% alcohol. Mm. And it kind of looks like watered down soy sauce <laughs> or if you're a fan of japanese food it really looks like the stuff they give you when you get tempura the tempura sauce yeah it does not taste like it though no it doesn't taste salty i feel like it tastes like if you made soy sauce and you took all of the salt out of it yeah i agree to that <laughs> yeah i think it is i don't know if being fragrant is a flavor profile mm. but it is very fragrant okay what would how would you describe the fragrance it tastes like cooking Shaoxing wine, as I've done. <laughs> <laughs> as I've cooked with it for countless times in my yeah. life. But, um... So I tried to drink this originally out of, like, a scotch glass, like a Glencairn glass. Mm. And it was too much aroma. I feel, like it's, <laughs> I feel like it's better suited for drinking out of a bowl. Yeah. It's a little bit more reasonable. So now that we've enjoyed our Chua-based beverage, beverage created with Chua. Um, and this is primarily made out of rice, by the way. In Western alcoholic beverages that use grains, okay. typically the grains are malted first, which turns the starches into sugars, hmm. which then the yeast can digest because yeast can't digest starch, Okay, but it can only digest sugar. So is that how they make? No. However, some enterprising Chinese alcohol makers discovered that you can do it all in one step, that you can turn the uh, starches into sugars and you can ferment the sugars without doing a two-step process. How do you do that? It's basically you add the yeast alongside certain other kinds of fungus and bacteria. Okay. And the fungus break down the starches into sugars, and then the yeast break the sugars into alcohol. Mm. So ancient Chinese wisdom. Ancient Chinese wisdom. So Q is essentially a chu is essentially a block of pressed grains. Mm. So it looks like a brick, kind of a little bigger than like a brick. Yeah. And you you take maybe it's wheat, maybe it's pea flour. It's kind of depending on what you're kind of trying to do with it. Pea flour. Yeah, like peas. Green peas. Green peas. Okay. Um, and you, you mush it into a block. Yeah. And you have a room where previously at some point you've created other chu. Mm. And you get it like hot and wet and you leave it in the room for a while. It gets the spores and the bacteria from the air. Okay. They grow into it. And so it kind of sticks together. Okay. And then you let it dry in the sun. And now it's like preserved. Mm. And so you can... You know, if, even if you use it like a year later, it'll still work. Mm. So so they're able to sort of mass produce it then? Yes. And they're able to have consistency. Mm. Because as long as you have some sort of a bit of a life cycle between the old stuff and the new stuff, you kind of constantly are replenishing your stock. Mm. Once you have the stuff, you crumble it up, you drop it into a vat of hot grains, let's say rice. Mm. And the entire fermentation process is completed in one step. As the process was refined... And chus were selectively produced. This produced beverages much stronger than what were present in Europe, up to seventeen or eighteen percent alcohol and strength. Wow! So when you see people in dramas or you know stuff and they're drinking wine and they're maybe not having that much, it's pretty strong stuff. It's not mm -hmm. like you know, it's not like beer or something or like you know, ten, eleven percent. Right. It's like sixteen, seventeen percent. Yeah. This same process. It was probably originally used to make alcohol. I don't think if anyone really knows. But this is how other items like soy sauce, vinegar, fermented bean curd are produced. Mm. They just have different formulations of chu. Okay. Other Asian liquors such as sake ended up using a related method. Like all Asian cultures. Yes, like all discoveries of humankind, <laughs> Cherry. Uh, came from China. Yeah. So this early wine was powerful. So this early wine was powerful and quickly became enmeshed in civil and religious culture and ceremony. Hmm. Unlike in Europe, alcohol never became an everyday beverage or foodstuff. In Europe, beer, wine, and cider were drunk constantly for various reasons as a daily drink, one being that fermenting tended to make the water safe. 
as the yeast outcompetes other dangerous bacteria. Mm. Uh, also, yeast, because it makes alcohol, tends to be more resistant to alcohol than other bacteria. Okay. So as it produces alcohol, it kind of sort of sterilizes it. Okay. However, in China, boiled beverages such as tea filled that role. So true. Water people always have boiled hot water since a long prehistory time ago. in China. Yeah. So you know that was never really a concern. Mm. So people just drank it to get drunk for various reasons. For fun. Or for fun. Or for ceremonial, ceremonial reasons purposes. and whatever else. Yeah. So it's generally reserved for special occasions. Elaborate drinking ceremonies were created and supernatural attributes were associated with wine, such as being able to commune with spirits. Mm. Much of this is topic for another episode, but Confucius recommend drinking in moderation. Everybody's got opinions on wine back in the day. Confucius think, does recommend everything in moderation, yes, though. Yes. <laughs> except filial um, piety. Oh, except that. Yeah. Yeah, except you got it. You got to go to the extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Respecting your elders. That is ex- everything else. Yeah. Moderation. moderation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So he said, you know. Drink in moderation. So that's the culture. Several ancient Chinese kingdoms mythically fell because of alcohol problems people, emperors or whatever getting too drunk so. oh okay but later on the Taoists, which is a little bit more of a fun religion yeah well, not that confucianism is a religion we'll just say philosophy it is um, more fun though I'll yeah say. It confucianism is, more fun. is less fun yeah Taoists often viewed drinking to the point of insensibility to be a form of self-cultivation mm, of experiencing all of life. Yeah. Yeah. How convenient is that? And so think, I think several famous Taoists drank themselves to death. Okay, that's less fun. But I mean, I can see why, you know. Yeah. If you like drinking, you start hanging religion, out. hanging out. You're like, actually, this is great for yeah. <laughs> you. Everyone should do this. How's that Shaoxing wine treating you? Well, it's making me even more warm. Yeah. In this already warm <laughs> I'm so room. so sweaty right now. So, um, however, everything is going to change about Chinese, the beverage scene. Okay. Around the year 1300, when distillation was introduced to the Middle Kingdom by traders from the West. Oh. Discovered several centuries earlier by Arabic chemists. There's some who apparently argue that China discovered distillation first, but it's probably not true. Okay. So, <laughs> not to be... Two Chinese. Uh, but like what dynasty was that? 13th century. Ren dynasty. Okay. It just, you see, it's I either, can't. It's either late Ren or early Ming. Okay. Yeah. Well, late or early Ming is very different. <laughs> no, no, I mean, or it's, it's either late Ren dynasty or early Ming. Or early Ming, Ming. Okay. I mean, it's, they don't know exactly when it started. Okay. So, but, but it, around, around that time period. Okay. And people think maybe it, I think it's maybe supposed to be late Ren dynasty because obviously the empire stretched all the way to the Middle East. Yeah. So That's it's more gonna, likely yeah. stuff would travel from the Middle East back to China. That's what I was thinking. And I said not to be a Chinese person it's just because 13th century doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah, and, you, you know, when you're I, thinking dynasties. You know, exactly. <laughs> and you go, okay, Lei Yuan dynasty. I was like, okay, that I can put into perspective when that was. Yeah, so it was originally used in the still, the, the, the reason they had these stills to distill stuff, and we'll mm-hmm. talk about distillation in a second, was to make perfume and cosmetics. Mm. And um, so the original name in Arabic apparently was mascara of alcohol. Oh, and okay. And that's, uh, it's like al-gahul or something is the Arabic for it. And so it kind okay. of got anglicized into alcohol. It's a little romantic of a notion. Yeah. Well, it's also a little ironic considering that's a place where people don't drink very much these days. And it's that's named true. after a uh, Arabic word. Well, you know, history does trick you sometimes. Yeah. Distillation is a way of producing alcohol stronger than 17 to 18%, hmm. which is at the point where yeast tend to be sterilized by their own ethanol that they produce. Right. So ethanol, for those who are unaware, has a lower boiling point than water. Heating the results of fermentation will create steam, which is higher in alcohol content than the base material. So you boil it, the alcohol kind of boils off before the water does. Okay. Some water will come up, but mostly it's alcohol. Okay. This steam can be condensed into str- extremely strong alcohol, upwards of 50%. This has a number of advantages as a process over simple fermentation. Mm. So one is you can do it to anything that is fermentable. You can use stems, skins of fruits, um, spoiled, you know, like damaged grain. Yeah. Uh, Since you're only boiling the liquid and collecting the vapors, you don't have to be as concerned about solid contaminants because, you know, you're just going to boil it, right? True. It's compact, it's high in calories, and it's easy to transport. So even like, for example, in the early American colonies... When there were farmers out further um, in the countryside, you know, they're not going to cart 
you know, big cartons of wheat all the way to the coast. Yeah. But if you distill it down into whiskey, then that's simple. It's transportable. Right. Um, it's kind of like very condensed. Sounds like they have discovered a uh, business opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, and so also like, you know, if you're a Chinese peasant, you're figuring out what kind of food to bury under your cellar with a famine, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's compact. Okay. Um, it basically can't spoil, which right. is important. Yeah. Um, as long as you protect it from evaporating and four is it gets you really drunk much faster than, than wine will. Yeah. Which I'm assuming is a, uh, it's a big plus. Uh, yeah. I just want to say this is the first time though. I'm, I'm very into this episode right now because this is like the first time I'm, allowed to openly drink any sort of liquid when, the, when we're during recording. the episode yeah usually yeah. usually not like shh, shh, shh. drink away from the mic yeah <laughs> now you're drinking a whole rice bowl of <laughs> shelving <laughs> wine so um, i cut, cut that out <laughs> so yeah the results of distillation were typically called baijiu or white alcohol mm. given that distilled alcohol normally unless you do something else with it is white is clear it's clear but you know so, what a what a what an opportunity to discover that what you know the racial inequality <laughs> of what well you know being white means like you are just a person it's clear oh that's true you don't true. have a label have a on color. you yeah. yeah well you know what how nice is that you know what they call it that okay yeah, I don't think I don't think we can I don't think we can you blame mean white, Chinese people yeah, I don't think we can blame white people for this one okay <laughs> try me <laughs> that, <laughs> that 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 the fact that some know, Chinese yeah. Chinese person in the in the Ming Dynasty called it white alcohol as a yeah. form of white supremacy anyway yeah <laughs> so it quickly gained a reputation yeah as a rough peasant's drink obviously it's very strong mm-hmm. normally it's made from crappy stuff it's got a lot of intense flavors yeah so you mean like it had a lower class. Yes, which is not unlike drinks like gin or whiskey in the mm. West. Okay. Brandy, distilled wine, was the classier distilled spirit in Europe and the U.S. Yeah. Gin and whiskey are kind of, were kind of low class. But as far as I know, there wasn't a brandy equivalent among the upper classes in China who continued to mainly drink Huangzhou. Okay. Uh, the rice wine. Baijiu quickly became extremely popular throughout China and enters in the accounts even of the Opium War and Arrow War, talked about as Samshu, which was the Cantonese term for a certain variety of Baijiu. Okay. If you read accounts and you look into the sort of early imperialism in China, is that a lot of Cantonese words, or Cantonese even like slang, entered English as just the Chinese name for things. Mm. And really you find out it was just like one town it's because that's where they landed. Yeah, and that's where they... When the oh, trading this, ports opened. Yes, and then they oh, this is what they call it, right? Mm-hmm. So... I mean, lots of people speak Cantonese. Yes, especially the people it's, they're interacting with. Yeah. But they call it just in general as Samshu. So you'll hear that referenced in accounts and stuff. The troops... Oh, no, the troops found some Samshu and then they got drunk and they... Okay. You know, wouldn't fight anymore. Yeah. <laughs> this huge amount of Samshu, which could be found in Chinese cities and villages, caused many problems with the foreign troops who fought in China. Okay. As they would find it, get drunk, get rowdy, cause problems. Mm. Even the Opium War escalated heavily. We we talked way back, but um, after Lin Zushu banned the opium, Mm -hmm. uh, Elliot took the people out on the ships. They were in Macau. They were in Hong Kong. They were kind of trying to figure it out. One of the incidents that really pushed it over the edge is a group of British sailors got drunk on Samshu and beat to death a Chinese person. And that escalated it further. And that um, basically is almost what pushed it into open war. Mm. That, I mean, that's more like an excuse, but I guess. No, no, no I mean, it is an excuse. But yeah. it is just that it is in- intertwined yeah. with the history. Just like, you know, wine in Chinese culture before that. It shows up a lot. Mm. Um, Baijiu production continued on throughout the Qing dynasty as certain aspects became more standardized such as sorghum as the primary ingredient for most brews. Sorghum is a grain. I think it's originally from Africa, Mm -hmm. but it has some advantages. It's more drought resistant. You can grow it in certain places. You can't grow rice. Yeah. So it's, they grow in Northern China. Yeah. So it became one of the ingredients of choice, though local and home producers would continue to use whatever materials were available. Mm. Get a quote from Derek Sandhouse, who wrote the book Drunken China. Okay. Let me pour us a little bit first for for our toast we can do. Yeah. Once I finish reading this. I'm looking at the bottle now he's holding so it. So I have here in front of me yeah. a bottle of Red Star Ergoto, which is 56%. Alcohol, yeah. And alcohol. And we're going to talk a little bit about Chinese drinking etiquette in a second. Ooh, this is not going to be fun. Or this is going to be lots yeah. of fun. Pass me yours. 
So we'll talk about more about Red Star in a second. I just want to I just want to prepare. So in 1949, Cherry, China was emerging from a prolonged period of this is from the book. Oh. China was emerging from a prolonged period of brutal foreign incursion, political infighting, and civil war. What party propagandists later dubbed the century of national humiliation. Yeah. For the first time since the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1912, the nation was unified under a single revolutionary leader who promised to restore its wounded pride. History has largely ignored the events that followed the speech. Mao's speech declaring that China has stood up. Yeah, on Tiananmen Square. On Tiananmen Square. But a second revolution quietly announced itself at that night's inaugural banquet. It involved what the freshly minted nation's leaders would drink, a decision that would predict and prescribe the future course of the Chinese alcohol industry. Whiskey, gin, brandy, those were out. Too foreign. Yeah. Ditto for wine and beer. Huangzhou was Chinese, but it was also the drink of the effete Yangtze Delta, <laughs> Yangtze Delta okay. and the ousted nationalist Kuomintang government, okay. which had made its capital there. Right. So Shanghai, Nanjing. So politically you know. not okay. <laughs> not okay, right? This is too fancy. This is too old China. Yeah. Right? Almost imperial. Yes. No. A proletarian revolution needed a proletarian drink. <laughs> the people, ahem, the people, he capitalized the P the second time, yeah. needed Baiju or Baijo. Needed Baijo. Not just any Baijo, but a Beijing Baijo that reflected the grandeur of the newly restored capital. Mm. There was only one option. It had to be Ergoto. Yeah. So let's have a little Red Star Ergoto. Is that why they named it Red Star? Uh, yeah, because it was, well, it's we're talking about name. it. It's not, it wasn't what it Red was Star created, before. It was created for the 1949 the speech brand. of China standing up. Yeah. Specifically. Okay. So let's uh, have a gambe here. We'll explain drinking culture in a second. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh. Do you have water? <laughs> Do you need some water, Sherry? <laughs> oh. So. How do people. I can't believe. Just, the Ooh, night is young. I'll save it for your. The night for is when young. you describe how popular this is yeah. going to become. So, what is our guitar? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it actually refers to a technique more than a specific brand. In modern day, there's several Ergoto brands, several yeah. Beijing Ergoto brands. Yeah. Literally, it means second pot head, a.k.a. second distillation. So distillation is when you, again, you boil the I steam. Know this, and, yeah. Yeah, you know, not okay. everyone's as smart as you, Cherry. Sometimes our viewers, you know. Okay. It's, just, it's just, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, you're right. Because... When we were preparing for this episode, yeah. you've also tried to explain to me what distillation is. Uh, and I'm just Because like, I was excited and I wanted to I talk know. about it. I'm just like, what, what's, what's, what's this, um, you know, obsession with explaining <laughs> <laughs> what distillation is? Okay, but you please, only had one shot so I know. far, Cherry. It really burned. Yes. Just in case our audience... Just, is, it's filling you with revolutionary spirit, just like the peppers. Is it, though? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just in case our audiences were thrown off by our very dramatic... Uh, um, expressions after those we drank of, those it. Those of our audience that have had by Joe probably are not thrown off by it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it means second distillation. The first and last parts of a distillation, when you boil the liquid, have the worst stuff in it. Yeah. And the middle part has the best stuff. So Ergoto has, they're basically saying we only use the good stuff yeah. when we distill. What's good stuff and what's bad stuff in this case? Well, so the, the main com thing that you can have if you distill alcohol incorrectly is methanol. Okay. And methanol is what makes you blind. If you drink, if you drink methanol and you think you drink uh, ethanol, you 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 can go blind and you can die. Okay. Essentially, and methanol is used for industrial purposes. So that's in the first and the third distillation. Yeah. So so like that's the thing. It's like moonshine and stuff. If they don't if they don't distill it carefully, that's why moonshine is dangerous. Real moonshine, not like. <laughs> the stuff you buy in a little mason jar yeah. at uh, I have bought one of those at before. Total Wine. Yeah. So yeah, the real moonshine back in the day, you know, during prohibition and stuff, you know, if they just put everything in there, it can make you blind. So Okay. Remind me to not drink real boop, uh, moonshine. Yeah. Not that if I not that I can get it today easily anyways, but That's one of the reasons why home home fermentation is fine. Okay. You know, like home beer making and wine because making it's not dis distilled it's not that dangerous but i think the government is a little bit hesitant to to kind of 
fully do home distillation because right. if you make it and you give it to somebody else, you could kill them. Right. So you, fermentation can only go so wrong, though. Yeah, it'll yeah. just taste bad or, you know, it'll be spoiled or something. Oh, you will be able to tell if it's bad or yeah. not. Yeah. Normally it'll smell weird or I don't know. So this multiple surviving, because obviously there had been a war on. Yeah. So multiple surviving Beijing Baijiu distilleries came together, not necessarily by choice, to form <laughs> the new Beijing Red Star Ergotol Company. Yeah. Factory, brand. It's a little unclear in Maoist China. It's not like it's a real brand, you know, but... This is a nationally owned entity. Yes. This Na- is a unit. A, a production unit. Yeah. We'll call it the Beijing Red Star Ergoto Production Unit. Okay. Supposedly, its logo was designed by a Japanese Red Army enlistee who, I guess, changed sides during the war or... I don't know how he got in the Red Army, but that's who designed the logo. Let's do an episode on this guy. His, apparently, his name was Sakurai. Oh. <laughs> okay. So huge amounts of it were produced in preparation for the October 1st proclamation of the new China. Oh, wow. Okay. Supposedly, the grain was all shipped in in American trucks because that's what they had because they'd taken it from the KMT. Shaking my head. Yeah. Um, and it continues to be produced to this day where it remains one of the most popular and iconic I shows. thought these people are supposed to be like people's servants. I thought all they do is to be concerned and worried about the people's well-being. And well, that's the you're helping the them with the well-being by having a drink, Cherry. Even the communists recognized uh-huh. that sometimes you have to have fun. Really? I learned that in college. We took a course on, I forget what it was, but one of the things we watched was, I think it was an East German summer romantic musical that the communists <laughs> made. I would about, never have thought those about, words would come together about in one group, sentence. About a group of... Like oh my God, teenage yeah. boys uh-huh. and a group of teenage girls who are both trying to get to the beach and they keep meeting up and having shenanigans and, you know, stuff happens and there's romance and it's all good, clean communist fun. Okay. Because even if you're a police state and you shoot people in the back of the head in the alleys, you, you realize that sometimes people just have to have fun. And so, you know what? People need to have fun on October 1st, China standing up. Yeah. Got to have some, some baijiu for them. Okay. When you say the people, I think you don't mean the people, by the way. Well, I think I mean, you mean the esteemed leaders of the Communist Party. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think... one. I'm of the, just saying this is not advertised, is all I'm saying. No, but yeah, but one of the things that like the communist, a communist state will take care to do, for example, the Soviets did, um, eventually, originally they tried to ban alcohol mm. because obviously... It's not good for people, and it's kind of a waste of money to produce it when oh, you could really? be doing other stuff. <laughs> yeah. But people really didn't like that. Yeah. And they realized, like, you know what? People need to have enough booze that they can get drunk on feasts and holidays and stuff. Yeah. And that's part of providing a the bounty of communism. Okay. So, and Red Star is not the only baijiu production unit. Okay. Which we'll talk so about. alcohol has, or baijiu has a place. Yes. In New China. So let's have another one. No, I, why? And let's toast to the health of Chairman Mao in the new China. Uh, I think the new China is pretty healthy <laughs> without you and, and longstanding, <laughs> even without our uh, great wishes. Let's take a moment now to talk about drinking etiquette. Now, it might seem strange. Cherry's Chinese. I'm talking about Baijiu <laughs> drinking etiquette. Here's the it's thing, though. It's not strange. It's not strange. Cherry's not a 47-year-old Chinese <laughs> businessman. <laughs> I'm not the main consumer like no. audiences. So Cherry really for... doesn't have any more experience. I it. have so many observers' experiences. Well, we'll talk. I've about been to it. enough Chinese banquets where middle-aged men drink until they fall down. Exactly, and then drive afterwards. Or <laughs> well, you yeah. know, th- there was a lot of drunk driving in my memory that I never thought it was a problem until I was an adult, and I was yeah. like, "Wait, they did that <laughs> all the time." Anyways. But yeah, well, please like, explain to like, me. It's not like China has an automobile safety problem or anything. Yes. So anyways, because of that experience, I did, I will say, this will be a learning experience for me for you to explain because I've never wanted to <laughs> get to know more about it. About it. It's an aspect but of your culture. But we're here now. Yeah. Yeah, we're here now. Let's learn we're about it. We're experiencing the Orientalism, Cherry. Okay. Yeah. So now this is a complicated topic. Different regions of China have different customs. We're going to go with... A very common set of practices, though, especially in the larger coastal cities. Okay. We can, this is, I guess, the prevailing, you know, in Shanghai, Nanjing, Yangtze area. Yangtze River area. Yangtze River area, okay. okay? So, probably Beijing, too. Okay, that's very different. Very far areas from each other. Like the middle, not not like up in the mountains. The coastal, the coastal coastal part of China, yeah. Coastal elites. (laughs) So, you can't see it. I'll post it on Twitter. But Baijiu is normally drank neat. 
no ice or mixers, and small shot glasses roughly one-third the size of normal, about 15 milliliters or half an ounce. That's what we're drinking today. Thank God. Yeah. It's not something for you to sip throughout the meal or really for solo drinking at all. And actually, one of the things that Western alcohol do when they... When Cherry and I have talked about this, when they advertise in China, is part of the thing is like, this is a classy alcohol. Yeah. So, you know, this is like something you, you can drink, have a scotch or yeah. a, a brandy and read a book at home. And like compared to Baijiu, which has very much a sort of a social yeah. active drink, right? Yeah. You're, not, you don't, you're not supposed to really be sipping Baijiu at home. No, because it's not that great. Well, I I'm going to challenge that, Cherry. Okay. I think you'll think it's great by the end of this. So, I don't know. I just had a shot glass of it and I'm really... Well, we're going to have some more. So instead, <laughs> you toast somebody by raising your glass. Okay. Normally with a hearty gambe, which means... Gambe. Empty the glass. And then you both drain the glasses and refill. Sorry, if, dry the glass. Dry the glass. Okay. Which is a little more poetic than mm. empty the glass. And you can slam it down on the table if yeah. you want afterwards. So ask, yeah. If you really want to get into it, the person with the higher glass during the toast is seen as more honored. So both sides may modestly track downwards until you hit the tabletop. Really? Well, you know, Cherry. Like how 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 you you're raising when you, the glass? When, yeah, when you when you tap it. So you know you try and okay. You're <laughs> supposed to tap the bottom of their glass, Cherry. Also, oh, these are very small glasses. So this is like a sort of a very position. But you know, precise. That's Chinese handiwork. culture. That's Chinese culture for you, Cherry. Okay. okay? So I much, never noticed so many, that. I'll say so many nuances. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, depending on the situation, others may fill your glass for you. If so, you can tap the table in a symbolic kowtow. Yeah, to thank them. If somebody gombays you, you're obligated to drink in these situations. You can't refuse? I mean, not, not politely, you know. Mm. And typically... You're not giving them face if you refuse. No, right? Then it's like, you're, 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 there's no social harmony, right? <laughs> they say, yeah, let's drink. If you say, no, I don't want to drink, social harmony destroyed. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> so and typically, you're supposed to return the favor, favor, quote unquote, by gombaying them back at some oh point God. in the meal. <laughs> so you're supposed to keep a track of who's gombayed you so you can get them back. But this would just become a never ending gombay like series of, of well, let's just all get drunk and it will never end. That's why China has an alcohol problem, <laughs> Now, since Baidro is often 50 to 60 percent, we're drinking 56 percent Red Star, yeah. this can obviously get quite, quite out of hand despite the small size of the cups. So, Cherry, you've got to gombe me back now. Oh, no. This will be my... What are we going to toast to? What are we going to toast to, Cherry? No, I'm the, not the gonna... standing up of a new China? Sure. Since we're in 1949 right now. Yeah, or we can toast something else. What do we want to toast? To our listeners? We'll toast to our listeners. Gombe to our listeners? Gombe to our listeners. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Gombe. Gombe. Ah. <laughs> <Ooh>. So, <laughs> you doing okay there, Cherry? I thought you were in a sorority. So <laughs> that was many years ago. Also, this is Baijiu. This is no okay. You don't you don't practice for this in a sorority. No. You're really making the the Chinese dude in the audience feel real tough. Now we're playing up how intense Baijiu is. Yeah, if tough means like, yeah, sure. <laughs> if this is what tough means, then you know what? I don't think I'm that tough. <laughs> <laughs> so cherry. Yeah. The ensuing decades would see Baijo production all over China brought into the state collectivized model. Okay. With multiple smaller distributors forced into larger enterprises. This did have positive benefits for the industry as a whole, though. Obviously, individual makers, you know, you have to collectivize. But many techniques of alcohol production were previously quite secretive. For example, if you have a chua production, you know what I mean? You don't let anybody else know how you made it. You've got right. your little shack where you build it. But now... So it's going to be hard to industrialize it. But now we're trying to industrialize it. Well, they did industrialize it. Right. Right. So now you have big companies making huge amounts of the stuff. Yeah. So... It's no longer something you pass down to your grandchildren. No. And then At least keep it within the family. And so methods were now spread across all the regions. Okay. In the name of communist brotherhood. Some brands, however, benefited more than others. For example, Joe and Lies, Mao's secondhand man... Favorite producer of Baijiu, Mao Tai, mm. quickly became the official drink for state banquets. Famously, it was also drank during Nixon's state visit to China in 1971. Right. Nixon, who was very bad, famously bad at holding his liquor, was essentially ordered by his staff to not drink the Baijiu <laughs> in response to toasts. However, when the time came, he did. 
Wow. But he kept it together. Though. They're like, under no circumstances must the president's cup be filled with Baijiu. Like, make this sure it's water. This stuff is 50-something. Yeah. Per- yeah. Okay. President Nixon famously would get drunk and like talk to protesters outside the White House at like 5 a.m. and like wander around the Capitol. Talking to them as in like supporting them? No, or? just like, just you like, know, hey, why are you guys out here? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so we're going to have, in honor, we're going to have some Maltai prints. Yeah. So the Red Star, let me just ask a question. The Red Star is not the uh, fancy baijiu that they drink at state banquets, though. It, at the time, it probably was. Okay. Because that was the first kind of big communist brand that they made. Okay. But, but then as time goes on, we have more But I think more be, brands because more. it was the original one and uh-huh. because it was so mass produced and so, dare I say, proletariat, mm. somehow... The leaders in the Communist Party wanted something a little bit more sophisticated. Mm. I know they're not supposed to want that cherry, (laughs) but this was seen as, and I think it's seen today as very much like, you know, you're a factory worker and you're, you know, you're hanging out with your buddies after the shift. Yeah. It is not a, a class. This is the, this uh, is the like, um, not even Jack Daniels. This is like the, you know, I don't know, old crow. You don't drink this on the dinner table. Mr. Mr. Papa or something vodka. Right. Okay. So so we're going to have some of this. We're going to have the state banquet yes. version. And you know if it's a fancy baijiu, because when you open it, it has this special little spout that allows you to pour very, um, I guess... Uh, delicately? Delicately to fill up the little cup so okay. you don't spill it. So, But this is... Maotai is the brand. Maotai is the brand. We're but, drinking Maotai Prince. Yeah. Because I was about to say, the, the version that they use for the state banquet, I've heard, is very, very expensive. Yes. So that's called Maotai Flying Fairy. Which is... Uh, Maltai Fatian. Yes, which is the fancy stuff. And that is like, you know, I don't know, three or $400 a bottle, depending on when you get it. Mm. And this is like $70 a bottle, which is still very expensive. Yeah. And I've... $70 a bottle of a whiskey is a nice This is one of nice the most whiskey. expensive bottles of alcohol I've ever bought. It's a very small bottle, um, might I add. Yeah, it's 500 milliliters or yeah. 375 milliliters. Yeah, so quite tiny. the things I do for this podcast... <laughs> So I looked it up on their website and they're like, it's basically the same yeah, as, as the fancy stuff. <laughs> no, I've looked, I've asked people who drink Baijiu a lot. Yeah. It just, they can't tell me what the difference is. <laughs> no. Aside from one's used for the state banquet <laughs> and is very prestigious. One costs more, so it must be better. Yeah. So let me read you the toast okay. and then we'll have a gambe. Okay. This is what Joe and Lai said to Nixon. This is an excerpt. The times are, cha- the times are advancing and the world changing. We are deeply convinced that the strength of the people is powerful and whatever zigzags and reverses there will be in the development of history, the general trend of the world is definitely towards light and not darkness. It is the common desire of the Chinese and American peoples to enhance their mutual understanding and friendship and promote normalization of relations between China and the United States. The Chinese government and people will work unswervingly towards this goal. I now propose a toast to the great American people, to the great Chinese people, to the friendship of the Chinese and American people, to the health of President Nixon and Mrs. Nixon, and to the health of all other American guests present. God bless Joe and Lai. <laughs> Only if that's still true. <laughs> Not that it was true, 100%, but oh God. Ooh, it tastes different. Yeah. It, I do taste the difference. We're going to talk about the different varieties. Yeah. This one burns a little bit less. It's a little more sophisticated. It, the aftertaste, yeah. it lingers longer. Yeah. Not in necessarily in a bad way. I mean, they all linger in a bad It really <laughs> burns. This stuff is burning so much in my stomach right now. <laughs> and just to put it into perspective, we've had, we've had three gambes, which is... In really tiny shot glasses. Which is the equivalent of like one shot. But I feel like we've had about five drinks in terms of the booze level. So... Yeah. But no, the Malta Prince, I do drink responsibly, everybody. Yeah. As you know, everybody drink responsibly. Now is a good time to get into the variety, the uh, varieties of Baijiu. Uh, we have. A, OK. Because I said before, it's a just means white alcohol. Yeah. But there's a lot of different types. OK. While it's often spoken about as a single type, it is actually classified into multiple distinct categories based on taste, aroma, ingredients, distillation method and other aspects. Ooh. There are some similarities that link them. But in others, the different varieties are as dissimilar as whiskey and vodka. Okay. So that's a quite big range. It's then. a big range. China's a big place, Cherry. Yeah. A lot of Chinese people. First, for similarities, basically all baijiu is fermented using chu, distilled and then aged in clay jars. 
This process is similar to how other spirits are aged in oak barrels, but the clay jars allow more air to interact with the baijiu, which means the aging process tends to be faster. Hmm. So the first common category, there are four, is light aroma, qin xiang. Qin xiang xing. Qin xiang baijiu, which is made from sorghum and fermented in stone, so either in jars or pits. Okay. In the ground, lined with stone. And but this Qingxiang trans are you gonna talk is light about? aroma. Yeah. So it means it has a light aroma. So it tends to have a light aroma, as said. Yeah. And a comparatively mild and floral sweet taste. Mm. Mild does not include the alcohol content, which is usually over fifty percent. It doesn't mean that these are like uh, has a lower degree of concentration. It means it's kind of a lighter. Just a li- lighter taste. Flavor and aroma. Yeah. So Red Star is light aroma baijiu. I feel like the primary thing you taste when drinking that is just burning and alcohol. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have much of a flavor mm. outside of that. The multi prince. No, no, the Red Star. Oh, the, okay, yeah. That's so this is what we yeah. drank first. Yeah. Red Star. So that's a light aroma baijiu. Yeah. In Taiwan, this is often called kaoliang, which is, means sorghum liquor. Kaoliang. Yeah. And there's a popular brand called Kinmen Kaoliang. There we go. Thank you, Cherry. Interpreting for the for the, for, for the for the while, for the uh, <laughs> That's what I'm here. Good for, yeah. Um, that that is made on the fortress island of Qinmen. Yeah. Uh, which is the one right off the coast of China that you can I see. I love China. how you called it the fortress island. It is a fortress that's, island. That's, that's the, okay. Right. Yeah. It's a fortress island. It, right? it is. Yeah. Um, that's that's Kimen's identity from now on forever. It's Fortress Island. Yeah. So some of it is aged in the. It's like Gibraltar or something. It's like Taiwan's. You don't know what Gibraltar is, but I it's don't a, it's, know. No. Anyway. <laughs> so. so, what, so uh, okay. What is Gibraltar? So. Oh, so we don't have time for the that. The Spanish coast. Okay. It, you know, it goes down and it almost meets Africa. Okay. Right. So Africa comes up at the entrance to the Mediterranean. Sure. Spain comes down off Europe. Yeah. Africa comes up. So there's there's, there's an there's island a little in gap between there. them. Okay. There's an island right off the coast of Spain. It's partially attached to Spain called Gibraltar. Okay. And the British Empire has had it, and I think basically still do does have it for a long time. Okay. And they built a big fortress there, and through it, they can kind of control. Who can come in and out of the Mediterranean? Mm, okay. And it was primary basis is just to be a military base. Okay. So. Well, this is very sad, but. Yeah. Well, now it you know it's not a military base anymore. Well, I know, no, but but I mean like naming an island as that that's the whole their their whole identity. I don't have a problem with. I just find it interesting. But it's normally said as a positive, like oh, that's the Gibraltar of the Pacific. I think oh, okay. Singapore was called that as like back in the day of like this is the this is the rock you know that they can't take it. But the Japanese took it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but one of the reasons that it's interesting is because um, in the military tunnels dug into Kinmen Island for mm-hmm. defense, some of them they age baijo in mm. because it's cool and concrete and stuff. So okay. there's a long actually history with the military in Kinmen and uh, alcohol. And they need their baijo. They do. Yeah. They have to. Sell, they had they to need self, their supplies. They had to self-produce it originally because <laughs> they were spending too much money shipping it in from Taiwan. Right. Um, post-1950, and so they're like, we got to grow it ourselves and make it ourselves here for the right. soldiers. <laughs> okay, so this is like what we call like, you know, it's like rice, it's like water, it's like it's medicine, a, it's, a it's one of the essentials. Yes. Yeah. It's like a ration. Yeah. So the next is strong aroma baijiu, which is nong xiang. Nong xiang xing baijiu. Nong xiang xing baijiu, with a very good cherry, good pronunciation. So this is the most popular baijiu by volume. Okay. And originally comes from Sichuan province. It uses earth pits for fermentation. What's earth pits? So, prefers use stone pits, like you know, almost like a swimming pool. You know, it's stone. Okay. To make lighter. Oh, so earth pits are just like mud. It's just dirt. You okay, dig a hole pit. in the dirt, okay. and it's basically mud. Okay. And these pits use continuous fermentation, such as the whereas you know you you ferment grains, you scoop out like ninety eight nine percent of it. Yeah. And then you you leave some and you mix the new stuff in with the old stuff. Right. And so you it keeps fermenting. Okay. So this process has gone on in some places for hundreds of years. Okay. Which is actually, I think, not dissimilar to some like sourdough starters. I think people, there's some famous ones that supposedly have yeah. continued on ages for and ages. ages and ages. Yeah. So this baijiu has a tropical kind of fruity taste mixed with a little bit of earth and funkiness mm. because it's an unlined dirt pits. Right. Um. A popular strong aroma brand is Wulanje, five grains, mm-hmm. which is made of a mix of five grains. Uh, we have some here, but I 
I feel like if we had any more types of baijiu, we wouldn't be able to finish the episode. Yeah. So we're not going to drink any strong. Well, we're going to have one more though. We're, we're going to have some strong aroma at the end. Okay. Next is sauce aroma. This is also made from sorghum and, and fermented in pits. Okay. But these ones are stone or are, are brick lined. Mm. The fermentation and distillation process is longer and more carefully controlled than some other types of baijiu, creating, in theory, a more complex and distinguished drink. Mm. The Mao Tai we're drinking right now is sauce aroma. Oh, okay, that makes sense. It has a very complicated umami flavor profile with all sorts of savory elements mixed in with over 50% ABV. Probably safer to start with light or strong aroma baijiu, though, if it's your first time. <laughs> Let's have another... Mao oh, no, I thought we're not supposed to. Okay. What are we going to toast I'm just it? counting. This is the fourth shot. What are we going to... But they're small, Jerry. We're fine. Drink responsibly, everyone. What should we toast, Jerry? To the long health of our cats. To the long health of our cats? How about Arturius? May he live 1,000 years. May he leave, live 10,000 years. 10, that would be pretty long for a cat. Well, that's... But that's the traditional... But then he'd be sad. That's the one, sweet. That's the traditional four. toast, oh, you know? okay. Long live Arturius. May he live 10,000 years. Arturius wants to. Gambe. Gambe. Arturius is our cat, if anyone didn't get that. but I'm sure So there is did. a bit of a Ooh. kind of a saucy aftertaste, a little bit of soy sauce. Yeah. A little saltiness. Yeah. There's more to it than, there's 100% that you can taste that there's more to it than the Red Star. Also, let me just put a disclaimer. I don't know. It, it, it could also just, it feels like it burns a little less. But these are our <laughs> third and fourth shot. So naturally, you would burn a little less. And we had some rice wine earlier. Exactly. So Yeah. So take that with a grain of salt. It is 3% less alcohol than Red Star Cherry. <laughs> so maybe it's just that that. So the last, well, I would say ranking them so far. I mean, I had more Baijos than this. But ranking these two, mm -hmm. I do like the Maltai Prince better. I mean, it is like 10 times the price. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I actually uh, don't know if it's going to be 10 times because it might be more than that because the Arguoto is so much bigger of a bottle. I think it's 20 times the price. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but this is um, typically sauce aroma Baijo is the most, there's not that many cheap brands mm. of sauce aroma. Okay. So it is kind of a fancy, fancy type. A fancy taste. So the last is rice aroma Baijo. I think that is, correct me if I'm wrong, Mi Xiang Xing Baijo. I didn't write it down, so maybe. The, the fermentation is different from the first three, and the primary ingredient is rice. Okay. And this one, unlike the others, first you um, turn the starches into sugars, and then you ferment the sugar. Okay. So it's not that one-step process as the others. Um, I've never had it, but supposedly it's a light and relatively approachable spirit for the Westerners in the room uh, compared to the others. Okay. What's an example of a brand? You know, I didn't write it down. But okay. if I have a chance to try it, I will update everyone. Okay. I couldn't find it, Cherry. We went to the, the Chinese liquor store. What was the brand you were trying to look for? I had a list. None of them were there. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Chinese liquor store and 99 Ranch. Yeah. So a, I Chinese, a Chinese liquor store in the United States. Yeah. So it's My feeling is, China. I don't yeah. know, Yeah. that it's it's just not that different. It's, it's, Baijiu has a very distinctive taste. And maybe yeah. if you're, 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 you want a taste of home... You know, you're going to you're going to want the first three we talked about. But I think rice aroma, <laughs> it doesn't have a distinctive enough taste okay. that people feel the need to import it. OK, that's my thought. But I don't know for sure. So now that we know the four main aromas, there are more. There's like Phoenix or there's like Phoenix aroma and all kinds of stuff. What's a Phoenix aroma. You know, I don't know, Cherry. I Has anyone ever tasted a Phoenix? I mean, evidently someone must <laughs> have. Now that we know about the main varieties of Baijiu and how it became China's national drink. Let's talk about it post Mao. So to be brief, things Mao, the natural divi divider in all of our episodes. Exactly. Just like 1949. Pre-Mao, post-Mao. Yes. <laughs> different, different times in history. So things got a little out of hand. Yeah. Baijiu had always been popular, but under communist production, most families would only have enough to drink during special occasions, making a booze-filled banquet a once or twice a yearly occurrence. Mm. However, in the post-Mao economic reforms, business boomed, and Baijiu did with it. Nearly every deal was lubricated with it, and it quickly became almost impossible to perform any sort of transaction or conference without it. Mm. We could do a whole episode on modern Gambe culture, but it quickly also became part of Guanxi. Basically, if you want to say, if you want to describe Guanxi charitably, it's networking. Networking. If you want to try it uncharitably, it's sort of a casual bribe culture. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, which is basically a way of just getting favors from people. Giving pe- favors for each other. Favors for favors, Cherry. Yeah. That's all it is. Trading favors. Yes. And sometimes that favor is that watch that somebody wanted or yeah. a very expensive bottle of Baijiu. Um, or a con- government contract. Or a condo somewhere, you know? Who knows? Yeah. So the more expensive and elaborate Baijiu, the better when you're giving it as bribes of and course. trying to impress people. Yeah. And the better drinker you were, the more connections and money you'd make in this booming China. Hmm. It got to the point where some people's entire jobs was drinking, um, either for themselves or in the place of superiors, or to drink a prospective partner under the table hmm. to gain respect. Okay. Considering how strong Baijiu is and the escalating amount these dudes, it's all dudes, had to drink to one-up each other. It's basically all dudes. It's all yeah. dudes. This created a huge public health issue. And there was a high-profile string of deaths, both in the private sector and within the Communist Party, though they were treated as workplace injuries. I, I mean, kind, they kind of are. I mean, they are, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it also racked up a huge cost, as government banquets um, would be drinking dozens or hundreds of bottles of Baijiu, costing the equivalent of $100 each or more mm. USD. Yeah. Right? So if you're having a banquet, you know, and you drink 500 bottles of Maltai Flying Fairy... You know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. This sense of excess became a focal point of Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. I say corruption in quotes. Mm -hmm. During his rise to power after 2012. Yeah. Expensive banquets were replaced with the rule of four dishes, one soup. (laughs) No alcohol mentioned. (laughs) No alcohol. (laughs) No bottle. (laughs) You want to have a fancy banquet to celebrate? Four dishes, one soup. (laughs) Um, And the price and production of high-end baijiu plummeted. Yeah. Maltai Flying Fairy, the CCP drink of choice, was viewed as a barometer of corruption and excess among China's elite. Yeah. The more expensive a bottle of Baijiu Flying Fairy is, the more corruption there is, the more bribery, the more excess. Yeah. The cheaper it is, it was thought. I, I will The more say, wholesome society is. I that. will say I have seen investment advice in like, if you want to know what stock to buy in China, and this is pre she. Yeah. Okay. This is pre the anti quote unquote yeah. corruption campaign. And they go, just buy multi. Just buy multi <laughs> stock. Uh, Everything else, you don't know. This one is a sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think actually at the time, um, buy like stock price was the most valuable beverage com- or alcohol company in the world. So those were good investment advice. It probably was, yeah. Too bad I didn't follow suit. No, don't do don't invest in them now. <laughs> well maybe. So um uh so Maltai's stock crashed um when this happened yeah and the price of a uh, multi flying ferry crashed as well going from hundreds of dollars to sometimes less than a hundred dollars wow where okay. it was seen as like if somebody if there was a picture of a banquet and you saw multi on the table Mm-mm-mm. you know you'd get in big trouble yeah so people weren't drinking it eventually though yeah the market stabilized somewhat and continued to grow However, COVID delivered a fresh blow to the industry with lockdowns and restrictions on public gathering. It did, however, seem to prompt an expansion into a new market, this crackdown, the United States. Ooh. So we're going to talk about that. But first, I'm going to make us a cocktail, Cherry. Okay. I'm going to make us a Baijiu cocktail, which wow. is not something that Baijiu was ever meant to be involved with. It certainly is not traditional. So I have created us a cocktail of my own invention. Wow. For us. Using? Ming River Baijiu, which is... Something cherry bought for me. Yeah, and I want to give credit to my friend, uh, Bear and uh, Andre. They recommended this to me, which I've never heard before. And I was like, there's a American Baijiu on the American market? Well, it's not an this... American Baijiu. It's still made in well, China. Yeah, it's still made. But, you know, it's a, it's a, let's just say it's a brand that's marketed to Americans, mainly Americans and yes. the Western market. But it's still like, a, but we'll talk, we'll talk more about Ming River. Yeah. In a second. Yes. But just for the record, this is a strong aroma baijiu. Yeah. Not just a, um, not a light aroma. It's got a little more flavor. No something, yes. This is no, it's, it's a serious business. Serious business? Yeah. Um, how strong is Ming River? Uh, it is, oh, 45%. Okay. So not crazy strong. Yeah. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the American baijiu market in a second. So the, cock, the cocktail I have, perf- I have created for us, Cherry, mm. is called a kombaijo because it's kombucha and baijiu okay that's my name for it let's let's toast first oh you know what this is really good are you just saying that cherry no i'm not just saying that (laughs) isn't it pretty good well in the past week or so nali has made me try all variations of 
different creations of baijiu <laughs> i wanted to make and a cocktail is, for this episode yeah but this is the best one i think you Thank landed you, on the right one <laughs> not the other ones you had oh. me try so, can so, i ask for the ratio um it's about one out o- one point five ounces of baijiu uh-huh. and maybe like eight ounces of kirkland brand <laughs> lemon ginger <laughs> lemon ginger kombucha kombucha but no ice the no lemon ice. ginger kombucha was already chilled. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I think this is very drinkable. I think so too. I think this would suit the American palate, but we're going to get into that. Okay. Derek Sandhouse, who I read earlier, is responsible for Ming River. Well, or the marketing for Ming River. Yeah. It's a the Chinese company that makes it. Yeah. Yes. He talks about the struggles of introducing Baijiu to the American market in his book, Drunk in China. But if anything, I think he underestimates the problem. Beyond possible issues like racism, fear of the unknown, and its divisive taste, Baijiu is a very specific alcohol meant to be drank in a specific social setting with certain types of food. Mm. None of those are present in the U.S., unless you're a Chinese-American or something like that, right? Um, Those brands that have found limited success in the U.S. tend to water down and refilter the drink into something tamer and more palatable to the average American. Yeah. So there's like brands like fire water yeah and some other stuff that it's like they take baijo they which is like 50 60 percent they water it down to like 35 percent or 30 yeah. percent yeah and then they just resell it right and they put a like an asian woman that wearing a kimono on their bottle or like a dragon or, or like, like a, a tiger it's, or something. it's a very orientalized yes so and weak and weak yes <laughs> um so most americans first experience with baijo and this is even Asian Americans who who try it, yeah. unless you're actually you have experience back in China with Baijiu. Yeah, it's sort of an incredul it's sort of like a incredulous people actually drink this stuff. Well, that's that was my experience, and yes. I am Chinese, Chinese. <laughs> yes. So, and which through cultural chauvinism often leads to some incorrect conclusions, like mm-hmm. Chinese people only drink this because they don't have anything better, or because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. It's not cheap. Well, some of it is. Okay, the rest are cheap. The rest are cheap. Yeah. They just drink it out of a sense of cultural obligation. Some people make this argument about mooncakes too, which is a totally different topic. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, okay. I, I, I'm having been to many Chinese banquets. Yeah. I'm going to say there's some truth to that. Sh- sure. I remember that there's actually some sense among mm-hmm. some Chinese um, executives and um, uh, party officials of relief yeah. when Xi Jinping banned Baijiu at the parties. Yeah. Because people are like, oh, finally, like I don't, I don't have to get hammered every single night yeah, at these parties. Exactly. So, but that's two. It's not about Baijiu itself, though. It's more. It's just like, about alcohol in general. Yeah. And three is the final assumption of they don't think it tastes good either, mm. but they just drink it through inertia. Yeah. Chinese people, that is, and Baijiu. After all, how could America, the cultural melting pot of the world, not have a Baijiu culture when we successfully integrated other Asian alcohols like sake and soju? into our drinking life right so there must be something it can't be something wrong with us cherry as american <laughs> there must be something wrong with baijo it's yeah. kind of where that sense of logic leads okay so the solution to this problem mm. taken by us by many such as i think derek sandhouse and others is that it's an education slash supply problem sort of like an if you build it they will come mm. american consumers are not familiar with the drink how it's supposed to be drank or where to buy it May I introduce a Chinese saying to what you just said? What's that? When you said, if you build it, they will come. There's a Chinese saying. This is a real one. I didn't make this one up. Sometimes I make Chinese sayings up to yeah. trick Natalie. But, <laughs> but it's, um, it's 酒香不怕巷子深, meaning uh, if the alcohol is um, ar- aromatic enough, mm. uh, it's, you're not scared or feared. It's okay that if it's, you know, the, 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 the store, the inn is at the deep end of the... Mm, of the alley of the alley okay so yeah if so if the alcohol is aromatic enough it doesn't matter if the if the bar is sketchy basically yeah okay or like hard to reach mm. but you know build it they will come yeah yeah so and but i think that's that's actually a better explanation of the if we make this a palatable enough product yeah if we show people why it's good they'll drink it even if it's unfamiliar to them yeah so a large number so um a large number of cocktails were created to pair with various styles of baijiu. There's a push to have it in bars yeah. and in alcohol stores. Yeah. But seemingly, at least so far, it still has not, quote unquote, taken off. 
Um, it hasn't impressed Americans by storm, and no, it's not in every bar kind of just yet. No, it's still kind of a a niche product. Okay. Obviously, the pandemic did not help, but I think there's a few flaws with the strategy chair. I'm going to armchair alcohol general. Yeah. These people, okay? Okay. Well, You're, these people who has actually done a great job. Ready for job my wisdom? Of, yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? It's not in every store yet, Cherry. Well, I'm a, I was able to find it in like Southern California. I guess it's okay to say that we're in Southern yeah. California. It's not in a multiple Bev- locations. It's not a Bevmo. Oh, it's not in Bevmo? No. Oh, okay. You have to special order. Oh, it. yeah. I did have to special order yeah. at a, like a sort of like a specialty. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty cool And it's not store, at the but... Chinese alcohol store either. Okay. Well, so just so here's on my... the off chance they will be listening <laughs> to this, uh, to here's this my podcast. Wisdom. Here's my wisdom. Please bear I'm with us. at them. Oh, you are. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's my wisdom. Okay. So one, this is the problems with this strategy. Uh-huh. Most of the cocktails that they present uh-huh. are very complicated, which is in order to handle Baijiu's strong flavor mm. because Baijiu was never meant to be used in mixed drinks. I guess that's true. So, like, and if you look at the cocktails, they're like five ingredients, right? Yeah. And they're all very complicated. Well, I mean, was whiskey or vodka like invented to be mixed in drinks? No. Okay. But... And we're going to get to this. Okay. The, 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 the culture built up over time. Uh-huh. And the original cocktails, like the old fashioned right. or like a, a whiskey highball, mm. were very simple. That's true. Okay. And then it grew with time. That's true. Okay. So cocktails are too complicated. <laughs> Number two, there is a lack of authenticity in them. Consumers like authenticity in taking on a new experience. They want some Orientalism, Cherry. Oh, no. They don't want to just have like a cocktail with That's a Chinese like a alcohol in it. Cocktail. That's not an experience. Okay. Right? That's just a different they name. They want the opium den with all the trucumens and No, the... not necessarily even that. They maybe even just want the mahjong table. Okay. You know, and like people are drinking, okay? I don't know if I'm... I <laughs> they, mean... They want the Chinese New Year lanterns up and the... They want that, okay? They want the experience. Yeah. I'm not endorsing that, but no. I, I do see... I'm not saying that's right or good, but yeah, I get yes. part of that. Yeah. Because if it's just in a cocktail, the consumer is just like, okay, it's just a different name on the little list of the ingredients in the cocktail when they order it. Yeah. Right? It's just like whatever, where right? Where's the Orientalist experience? No, where's the Orientalist experience in that? So, <laughs> so therefore, because of my love of Baijiu, I have two recommendations to the Baijiu industry okay. that no one will listen or follow to because I am just... Person on the internet. Oh, you don't know. You're going to add them. <laughs> I am going to add them on Twitter. So here are my two suggestions. Okay. Develop some simple mixed drinks of one or at max two editions. Mm. This is my, the Kombaiju. It's Com- just, <laughs> yeah. it's just kombucha and baijiu. Okay. And I think it's pretty good, Cherry. I think it's pretty good. Also, you know what? The, the baijiu, you can, you can taste it. Even though there's a lot of kombucha in this, you said 1.5 ounce of baijiu. It's like five to eight. one kombucha to, yeah. to baijiu. But you can taste the You baijiu. can taste it, but it doesn't burn and it's not overpowering, right? No, but I can tell this is likely baijiu. English. If you sniff it, it has a very intense mm, aroma yeah. coming off of it. Yeah. So we need, we need stuff like that. I think even if you reduce it a little bit, I, I could stomach this. I could enjoy it too. With, with even reduce less kombucha. Ratio. Yeah. Wow, Cherry. Okay. So... For example, gin also has a very strong flavor and was never meant for cocktails. Mm. Gin was basically just a way of how can we make just raw alcohol with a little bit of flavor mm. so people will drink it. Back I in like the day. gin though. I like I when it's like herbal and... I know. Yeah. That's good gin. Gin <laughs> used to be real cheap. Okay. Um, but it is tamed by adding tonic water and lime juice. Yeah. We need the gin and tonic of Baijiu. Mm, okay. Which I will... I'm not saying it's the ultimate. <laughs> I'm going to... You're push forward <laughs> my com- combajo. Combajo again, okay. The other option, my other option is if, you know, if you used alcoholic kombucha, you could drop a shot of baijo in it and make like a baijo bomb. Wow. Okay. Which like leads, a sake bomb. With like a sake bomb. Okay. So this leads into my second suggestion, which may be illegal, but... Why would it be illegal? Well, I don't know how you're allowed to ad- advertise alcohol because I don't know anything about this. <laughs> Okay. Encourage the frat bro drinking aspect of how <laughs> Baijo is drank in China. Sell it as a gift set with the tiny cups. That's a good point. Yeah. Because people will drink sell it. That. Maybe that's a good gift set idea. with the tiny cups. Yeah. Because Baijo, because it's meant to be drank differently. If you, if I I like Baijo, if I tried to do a 1.5 ounce of Baijo mm-hmm. in a shot glass, 
I think I would throw. I think I would throw. So you up. can't use the regular like American sized. No. Shot glass. I mean, they might not be American. They might just be a you know Western size. Yes, yeah, Western size. I just think if if you drink it in the, the tiny cups, it's a lot more manageable. Mm. It's more approachable, right? Not I mean, to mention, it also gives you the total Orientalist experience yes. that I'm not endorsing. Yeah, and you could have a little booklet but, in there yeah. of the gambe and the toasting stuff. Everybody loves a little Orientalism. So I don't know if everyone does. Well, Asian Americans don't, but you well, know, I don't. I'm only a quarter Asian American, so seventy five percent of me. So you me, can stomach a little bit. Seventy five percent of me likes the Orientalism, so I'm providing. I should you, boycott you. Yeah, you should. <laughs> I am providing these excellent ideas, yeah. free of charge. Okay. So, so are you saying, or you might get to it, mm. that the whole like selling it was the little cups idea, for example? Not only is creating. An experience around the baijiu, right? To as a wholesale experience, but also you're saying people's got to be able to drink it by itself, maybe. Yes. Okay. I think there's two things. I think one, you have to have a simple cocktail. Okay. Which like, like for example, vodka and, and ginger beer, mm. right? Gin and tonic, right. whiskey and whiskey and coke, right? Right. That people could just make at home. Mm. That's simple. Yeah. And then two, you need to encourage people to actually enjoy the drink on its own merits right and i just think if you don't give people the tiny cups the big american shot glasses are just too big right or or just international shot glasses are just too big for Mm. it okay Um, i can see that so those are my free ideas and the reason i said it might be illegal is because like if you provide if you have like how to gombe and toast or like if you have chinese drinking games in there or something i think that might be seen as encouraging people to get too drunk, mm. you might not be able to do that. Okay. Like, I but don't the think... shot glasses, though. No, that's fine. We see that all the yeah. time. Yeah. Like, for example, I don't think you can sell beer pong sets. I think you just have to call <laughs> it, like, table... Table game. Table, <laughs> Non-alcoholic, <laughs> clean fun. and fun <laughs> yeah. table game. Adventure game, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, what's the future of Baijiu Cherry? Oh, what's the future? Well, it's not clear. Western alcohol is clearly making inroads into China, especially wine and whiskey. Oh, yeah. And this isn't just foreign stuff. Numerous domestic brands are cropping up to compete with traditional alcohol. And we see this like in Japan, right? Japan has all sorts of whiskey and gin and and Japanese versions of international alcohol types. Yeah. Also, I'll say, even though, of course, the main audience of Baijiu, which I mean, the stereotype checks out here. Although I'm not, I haven't done the market research on this, but I bet you it's the middle-aged men in China, right? Who are the main audience uh, yeah. or, or that purchases Baijiu. Yeah. So obviously they're not going away anytime soon. No. So we don't have to worry about that. They keep drinking them. <laughs> well, yeah. But the young generation, it's not cool to drink Baijiu. It's not part of the culture. No. To, you know, you Here, want, yeah. So young people tend not to drink Baijiu except at family gatherings. Yeah. And if you want to flash your wealth, a bottle of expensive champagne may be more impressive. Yeah. Than a bottle of Mao Tai. Not just maybe. It is, yeah. right? You know, if you if you want to get out of the Lamborghini and, you know, flash that your wealth, although it's a little le- lean times in China at the moment, but... Uh, <laughs> there's still some Lamborghinis around. There's still around, Lamborghinis yeah. around. But, you know, like Mao, Mao Tai is seen as like just this old stodgy, you know, yeah. thing. So not that nobody does. I mean, it's, it's still in some places, but it's a, it's a bit of a battle at the moment. Mm. So still, there are hundreds of millions of drinkers in China of Baijiu and millions more abroad, yeah. the Chinese diaspora. So Baijiu isn't going anywhere for now. Despite the current issues with the market, I think it will continue to grow and adapt and someday, eventually, perhaps by following my advice, will reach a <laughs> worldwide presence like other great national spirits of the world. Mm. However, as a Baijiu liker, I encourage you to try this responsibly. Here's my challenge. If, you, if you're interested in Baijiu after this episode, get some spicy Sichuan food with your friends or family. Buy a bottle of Strong Aroma Baijiu at your local Chinese grocery store. Wulanjie has some decent stuff in the $10 to $30 range. If you can find Ming River, get that. You can maybe get Ming River online. Yeah. Fill up your shot glasses one third of the way until they produce the gift set that I'm suggesting. <laughs> Don't fill it up all the way or you'll throw up. Yeah. And ganbei to each other's fortune. Okay. Have a little fun. Maybe you might just get a taste for the stuff. Or try my Kambaiju cocktail. I'm quite proud of this. So <laughs> I think I might be drinking this. It's not bad, right? In the future again, yeah. Yeah, you, I can make this. You can make it for somebody. They'll be, What's this? Yeah, you'd be like, well. Okay, let's try it next time when we 
We'll have make it for somebody. Oh, you situation. want a drink? Yeah. Okay. So one addition. If you're looking online, there's a chain of Chinese liquor stores in California called Mr. Fossil, <laughs> where I got some of the nicer stuff for this episode. They have reasonable prices and claim to ship nationwide. So it might be worth checking out. Mm. I also, Cherry, I want to talk about one other thing, which I think is interesting. Okay. So China has been going through some issues lately. Oh, really? Some may say yeah. it's because of ling- lingering issues that have finally erupted after like bubbles that have popped after dozens of years of ignoring them, like housing prices and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But there's another possibility. The Chinese system, Cherry, for hundreds of years, thousands of years at the elite level has relied on alcohol to lubricate deals mm. and, you know, make connections right. and make things happen. That's how things are done. That's, how, down. that's, how, that's how things were done. done. Yeah. And throughout the entire Chinese boom period, you know, little gifts, dinners, banquets, getting drunk. Yeah. Doing maybe karaoke. Yeah. Is how deals were made. Yeah. Maybe they weren't always legal. I but, mean, but, likely they yeah. weren't but, really but, good. but stuff yeah. got done. Yeah. Now, though, Xi Jinping banned it. Mm. The system was never designed to operate in a transparent and above the board <laughs> level way like it is in the United States. And without these kind of backroom deals. Let's not promote the United States too much. But you Well, know. I mean, I'm not saying the United States does work. I'm just saying yeah. it was designed to work it's transparently, sort of right? Yeah. Okay. Chinese system... There's one set of rules, but you know what? People decide between some some shots of Mao Tai yeah. about a deal. Yeah. Maybe that's where the real deal happens. That is, that was where where the yes. real deal happened. But now those deals can't necessarily happen anymore. No more Chinese banquets. And so there is some level of state paralysis. Mm, okay. From not having booze. Right. To lubricate things. So they're saying it's hard to function. And there's nothing, the procedures, the clean procedures and all that yeah. that are supposed to happen, like we discovered in the last episode, yeah. aren't really functional. No. It's not practical. So basically now nothing happens then. Well, I mean, things oh, happen, yeah, but, it's hard but that's, to, one, that's one theory yeah. for some of the issue China's having of like, oh, maybe some apartment building that people paid for doesn't get built. Maybe the permits didn't get done. Maybe some loan didn't get through. Maybe some deal to get some supplies didn't come in, mm. right? And maybe if everybody had gotten together, had a couple glasses of Mal, have a couple bottles of Mao Tai, Henry Kissinger famously said, meeting with Deng Xiaoping, with enough Mao Tai, anything is possible. So <laughs> Henry Kissinger said Henry that? Kissinger Not said, the other way around? No, Henry Kissinger said that. So You sure he didn't mean that I'll get so drunk and then I'll agree to anything anyways? I mean, maybe, but hey, yeah. that's one way of making progress. That's true, yeah. So maybe, Cherry... If people had a little bit more baijiu. No, I think the middle-aged men in the Chinese government <laughs> should just work harder. <laughs> now, that's, now that's a thought, Sherry. <laughs> I think they should just know, do that, what they're supposed to I, do. <laughs> and maybe like approve things or like get stuff done and yeah, like yeah. do regulations. Yeah. I mean, that's not going to happen. I so. think they should just follow the law they've made themselves, you know. Or write better is laws. Is it that hard? Or yeah. write better laws. Yeah, but now they're, you're saying they're like, uh, no more Chinese banquets. How could we ever get things done? No. Yeah. How are you supposed to get... How do we get backroom deals yeah. without the back room? <laughs> but yeah, Cherry, that's the Baijiu episode. Okay. Okay, you like that. You're almost done with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is so much more of a... Prez- uh, a pl- plez- <laughs> <laughs> this is so much more pleasant of an experience the than the shots, shots of, I've taken. The drinking <laughs> shots of Red Star. Yeah. I feel like this episode, the audio is going to be completely unsalvageable. <laughs> and just people are just going to have to accept that. Yeah. Well, you know what? We've had all these episodes without any music, without any, <laughs> any really yeah. just us talking. Yeah. So this episode has a little bit more smacking yeah. of the lips, <laughs> you know, clinking of the glasses. And there's a lot of stuff. I'm slightly a little, you know, this is getting to me. <laughs> oh, only slightly? Oh, these are strong alcohol. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, but like <laughs> strong, just like the spirit of the Chinese people, Cherry. Um, say, say. What's that? Here, here. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, I feel like we got a couple other topics in here still. For example, like I think talking about wine in sort of imperial Chinese history and the culture and all of the kind of like like Taoists and Confucius. We're going to do an episode on that? That would be a good episode, right? Okay. We don't necessarily have to get drunk during that episode. I think that episode we could just... Well, I'm liking this idea of getting drunk during recordings, though. 
Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a lot more casual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we could have a. The air is a little less tense. Yeah. Yeah, I think we warned the viewer, the listeners ahead of time. Yeah. That this might get like this. Yeah. So, what are your opinions on Baijiu Church? Do you think it's gonna make it? Do you think it's gonna? Well, compete I mean, on the I like stage? the Kong Baijiu. <laughs> I like this idea. I really, I don't know if I'm gonna be sitting in a room, even with friends around, reach for the shot glass to drink <laughs> Baijiu, like, unless I have to. Yeah. I just don't see that happen for me. But once again. I'm biased because I don't have a lot of really good memories, right, with Baijiu,、mm. as I've witnessed, like you said, the party culture where and business culture and business and- culture where things are done. But it is it's almost like a form of alcohol hazing, and、yeah. in order, oh, one hundred percent, you know, it's like it's like cigarettes, right? Like it's like in order to be part of the gang,、yeah. in order to f- bond with your bro, I'm gonna say bro here because it is all men, or like. Ninety nine point ninety nine percent, man. Yeah, and but maybe it, they'll have some women there to pour the bai zhou. But yeah, I know I've seen that too. But <laughs> in order to oh, as a side note, yeah. So Derek Sandhouse's book, he also has a book on different bai zhou varieties, which is which is not bad. But、um, his book, Drunk in China, he's talking about going to various regions of China and doing research for the book, and also for Ming River and like you know what kind of brands he thinks he could bring to the U.S.、Mm-hmm. And you know, you know, you go drink at places, and you know, especially some of these areas, Americans aren't very common. So Chinese people want to drink with them, and you know,、yeah. talk to them and stuff. And one thing he describes is almost every night, once enough booze gets started drinking, it's like, oh, like basically, like let's go to a brothel.、Yeah. Let me introduce you to some girls. Oh yeah, like, I believe that. Like, and and it's like he has to always steer the conversation away from that. <laughs> He's married, and also like you know. Well, I'm I mean? sure the men inviting him to the brothel were also married, too, married. right? But、yeah. it's like it's like well, of course that's what we're gonna do as yeah, relatively well off Chinese dudes. Now that we've got some booze in us, we'll do some karaoke and like you know、mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so you know that is the the definitely the downside of the culture. And I think, for example, wine way more popular among Chinese women. Yeah. Than than baijiu. Baijiu is not very popular among Chinese women. Chinese women are basically, I think, according to his research and stuff and, and market research, basically only drink baijiu when they have to. Yeah. Like I mean, not all Chinese women are like that, but like family gatherings, a business、yeah. meeting, that kind of stuff. So baijiu has a cultural connotation, which I'm gonna say again, linked tied to middle-aged Chinese men who are. Powerful, I and mean, maybe aside from like the migrant workers were drinking with、yeah. their buddies after work. Well, the expensive but, baijiu has that yeah, connotation,、exactly. like yeah. like Red Star, and you know, every, multiple people drink that. But you know, the people who who drink this three four hundred dollar bottles of stuff to、At、show dinner off, dinner tables, yes, are that group.、Mm-hmm. So you know, I don't know if that's. <laughs> yeah, do you think baijiu is going to take off in America, Cherry? Well, if Kong, if Kong <laughs> baijiu, if Kong baijiu or the little sets gets made. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we'll have. Well, I maybe, do think. Here's you know my、what? free advice, Ming River. Maybe I'll like make a clip and I'll and I'll and I'll like tag Derek Sandhouse. Sure. He should have two sets. He could have the kombucha set. Although I think you have to refrigerate kombucha, so maybe it wouldn't work. But he can. <laughs> <laughs> and then he can have the little glasses set. I mean, the, I, I've seen their website. I like the website, which has a lot of. It is a cool alco- website.、Um, which has a lot of.、Um, Uh, uh, cocktail recipes, and、oh, but most of them are just most to of them the are just、side. so comp. I was gonna make one of those ones, and it was like, oh,、uh, I gotta get like. I made you one, I think one. I know, but you gotta put like an、bottom. apple in it. Yeah. Just, well, it, it was good though. It was good. But it was work. I know, but it、yeah. was work, and I I feel like one advantage of this. Yeah. I do feel like you taste you do taste the baijiu like it does、yeah. in the kombucha. Yeah. <laughs> Sure.、Patent、Let's、pending. say this is a this is a great idea. Yeah. And it's gonna get adopted. But you know what? After this episode, I'm thinking, because honestly, I bought this Ming River for you, right,、yeah. for Christmas. And I was thinking, okay, well, you will try it. Maybe you will like it. Maybe you won't like it. But now I'm thinking, maybe you always have one bottle of Baijiu around. Well,、maybe. now at the moment, because <laughs> of your research, we just have, on the table. Just、yeah. on the table, we have three, and I know we have a few more in the kitchen. Oh yeah. God knows when we're gonna be done with those. <laughs> 
We're going to have some but, Chinese banquets, Cherry. Yeah, but who I can, think... Who, who, who can we invite over to try and get them to convince us to let them build, a, like, let us build a bridge or something or, like, you know, like, provide yeah. concrete to something? Yeah, well, I think we're going to get into, uh, once again, get into the middle-aged Chinese man... <laughs> Guanxi culture. Guanxi culture, which I don't recommend anyone do, not even middle-aged Chinese <laughs> men. It's bad for their livers, it's bad for their personality, it's bad for Chinese society. Anyways, uh, bad for their family. So... <laughs> But my point is, I think we'll always have one bottle of baijiu around. I think we want to, I think I want to, I want that in our little collection of alcohol in our It could kitchen. be Ming River. It could be. I think we'll, well find. Well, we have one now, so. I think we could know. find some more simple cocktails. I think we yeah. could give this yeah. to somebody and they would think it was good. Not knowing it was baijiu. And they'd be like, what's in this? Well, we don't Kombucha have to trick them baijiu. into it. You know, we don't have to be like lying that it's not baijiu, you know. Well, we could just not say anything. We could, Sure. And that'll be a victory for the Do Chinese we have people. friends that trust us so much that whatever we make, they will drink? Maybe my mom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we'll try. Watch out, well, my mom. <laughs> we'll, we'll update in the future episodes or on Twitter if that yeah. does happen. Well, anyway, if you actually listen to all this, thank you for putting up with it. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah. And hopefully you enjoyed it and you responsibly try some Baijo yourself. Yeah. If you do, we highly try recommend. It, I'm gonna pick pictures on. We're gonna pick pictures on Twitter of the stuff involved in this episode, what we drank. Yeah. And if you do try it, or you're you already like by Joe, let, let us, us know. know. All right. Have a nice day, everybody, and thank you for listening. See you next time. Kanbei. <laughs>